it was terrific. Oh, absolutely. Where does the town go? There's a lovely bar. I'm not yeah. sure. Yeah. Can you imagine that? We had a bit of a wobble with supercar. <laughs> Don't tell my wife. Oh, oh. so it's randomizer Chris. Yeah. And what are you bringing to the pub? Um... The Jerry Anderson Podcast with Jamie Anderson, Richard James and Chris Dale. <laughs> oh, hello. It's, oh, oh, we're back again. Oh, gosh. It's like a, hello, didn't see you there. Yeah, we just come popped on into in. existence. Yeah, exactly. Yes, well, now you're here. Why not come in and enjoy the Jerry Anderson podcast? <laughs> yeah, let's just make it up on the fly. Yeah. <laughs> like we always do. Yes. We're here for the next, oh, I don't know, hour, hour and a quarter, something like that. Yeah. Celebrating all things Jerry Anderson. Uh, talking about all things Jerry Anderson. Watching some things Jerry Anderson. Yeah. And reading out some emails about all things Jerry Anderson. Yeah. Can you see there's a linking theme here? Yes, you saying those things. No, the works of Jerry Anderson. Of course. Yeah. Uh, so join us for the next uh, hour and a bit. Uh, join us for the Randomizer Chris. Oh, yes. Randomizer Chris. Another. Yes. another <laughs> That's my new name. <laughs> random episode of a Jerry Anderson oh, series. Yes. For us to enjoy. What could it be? Who knows? Well, we don't know because it's random. It's random. That's what we get from pressing yeah. this red button here. That's right. Exactly. In fact, this week we'll have our special guest pressing that button to choose the yes. random episode. And who will that be? Well, that's Chris? Gary Tonkins. Yeah, who is? Uh, art director on Terror Hawks. Yes. And has subsequently gone on to work on such films as Rogue One, Star, Star Wars, Wars. Yeah, yeah. Harry Potter yeah. things. Yeah. Yes. He's Big very friend. busy. Yeah. So and still made time to come and see us. He has, yeah. Oh, Isn't that nice? Gary. Yeah. And what are you bringing to the party? Well, a bit of Jerry Anderson news. Oh, oh wow. a bit of Jerry Anderson right? news. Yeah, nice great. News. Excellent. Uh, and also, of course, the people who bring the most to the party are our wonderful viewers and listeners, the Podstrons themselves. Oh, yes. Who've been emailing in their droves. Podcast at JerryAnderson.com. Is it droves, really? <laughs> are we still at droves? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. we've got plenty. Don't That's you worry great, about fine. that. Good. Yeah, they have thoughts to share and comments to tell and reviews to... Review. In <laughs> In part. <laughs> Yeah, but that's enough of that. Brilliant. <laughs> Should we have some Jerry Anderson news? Um, yeah, all right then. Yeah. It's the Jerry Anderson news, 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 news. Yes, it is. One one week we'll get it all in. In sync. Perfect sync. But yes. If we, yeah. do, if, we, if we ever do that, I'm going to clip that out and use that every week. Perfect. Oh, so then we don't have to do anything else ever again. <laughs> Great, good. Nice. Go on, then what's in the news? News, well, I think a welcome is due. Right. Oh, yes. He's not in the room, but oh. he is on the website. Is he? Yes. A name that many Podsterons and Ander fans will know. Yeah. Fred McNamara. Mm. The man of many syllables. Um, has written some books, including uh, Terror Hawks, Flame of Thunderbolts, the story mm -hmm. of... The making of and oh. the full history of Terror Hawks. Yeah. Yes, that follows on from his uh, book Captain Scarlet Spectrum is Indestructible, was that yeah. one? Yes. And, and many others. Um, Fred is a, a, a prolific writer online and offline and has joined us as our website editor. So welcome, Fred. Oh. Uh, he's doing all sorts of lovely content every week. Yeah. Um, some sort of very broad and welcoming for, for new Ander fans. Yep. Some much more detailed and almost quite niche, 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 I would yeah. say. Oh, it's it's, a, it's a very wide range of material that he's posting. Yeah. I, I recently saw an article he posted about uh, the top 10 um, best stories of the sort of Stingray extended universe from the worlds of comics and novels Ooh, and so forth. So, yes. A deep dive, as they say. Yes. Ah, perfectly Stingray themed. It is indeed, yes. And also, mm -hmm. that neatly leads us into our other news item for today. Right. Oh, yeah. It's talking about the best Stingray stories from the extended universe. Oh, oh wow. wow. Well, I we, we have with us the author of uh, the opening novella, I would say novel now because it's I quite long. It's, it's, the it's opening expanding, yes. novel yes. of the 60th anniversary multi-platform Stingray story, Deadly Uprising, Chris Dale, who is the writer of the Titanican Stratagem. Oh, that's right. Try saying that after yes. a couple I'd rather of, uh, Thank you. Yeah, marine <laughs> cocktails. Uh, so, Chris. Yes. Would you like to tell us a little bit about it? Well, uh, the Titanican Stratagem, it yes. kicks everything off. Uh, essentially, sort of follows on a bit from Deadly Concerto, picks up a thread there. Um, basically, Titan has decided, I've had enough of all this not winning to Stingray. Mm. Let's try a new plan, yeah. which will guarantee yeah. that we win against Stingray. Right. Um, perhaps it involves getting a load of other old enemies together and uh, yeah. see if we can make this work as a team. Oh. Um, try being the operative word, because uh, as we'll discover in my first book, it doesn't go too well. But the first people he recruits are a bit sort of like, actually, we don't want to do this. Okay. And, oh, uh, yeah. 
is, is sort of reasoning that the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and he's mm. going to find out that the that enemy of his enemy is in fact yes, his enemy. Indeed. So yes, oh, just Titan is going to poke the hornet's nest, and he's going to get stung, and he's oh. going to get the wasp stung as well. Oh. So it's uh, oh. there's all sorts of uh, getting the wasp stung. <laughs> oh, oh, right. I didn't even realize he was doing that. The wasp stung. Yeah. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, so no, you mentioned that, Chris, the first book. First book. Well, yes, someone else is writing another book oh. later on. We we also to follow the Titanic and stratagem. We have several comic anthologies, a mixture of uh, the old TV Century Twenty One Stingray strips and some new strips, yep. written by a whole selection of writers. And we have a concluding novel. Um, am I allowed to say the title? Yes. Yes, because it's been announced. Yes. Project Orca. Okay. By Bob Ayres. Yes, it hey. is. Which, which is the story that ties everything together. Wonderful. Yes. Fantastic. And uh, I can also, I believe, exclusively reveal mm. that there will be an audiobook reading of both of these books um, performed by... <laughs> the first book performed by... The first book performed by... Mr. Wayne Forrester, oh, yes. who is Lovely very excited yes. and keen to get down to, because uh, yes. he, he plays phones in the, uh, the previous Stingray uh, novel audiobooks. And X20. And X20, yes. yes. Well, now he's going to be playing Troy and Commander Shaw and Titan and Atlanta, Marina. Yeah. Good old Wayne. Yes. I have an exclusive, but I will also an exclusive, another t- exclusive, <laughs> and but also, also a tidbit, a, a yeah, well, micro a tidbit. fab fact. Yes. We discovered that Wayne would be an excellent X20. When he did a Doctor Who seventh Doctor story for me, yes, called the Quantum Possibility Engine, ah, yes. where he plays a robot who is a little kind of creep essentially, yeah. and he did his Peter Lorre voice oh. for that. Oh. And I was like, oh god, he'll be a great X Zero one day, and now he is. <laughs> yeah. Isn't it great? yeah. So uh, my other exclusive is what? What's going on here? All connected to Stingray Deadly Uprising. Okay. Is that an as yet unannounced element? Of Sting- Stingray Deadly Uprising for free. <gasps> What's going on? Are a set of video shorts which will be released on YouTube. Right. Called Marine Minutes. Marine Minutes. And in the Marine Minutes, the stories will be expanded on, connected together, uh, added layers, little yeah. reveals. Well, well. Uh, and they will be uh, sort of sprinkled across the year on our YouTube channel. Yes. But again, we, we should stress that you can enjoy any part of this narrative as a standalone piece. But if you get everything and experience mm. everything, you will get slightly more out of it. Yeah. But. All to celebrate the 60th anniversary this year of Stingray. Yeah. yeah. Incredible. Well, well done, everybody. That's, that's quite a mammoth undertaking. Everyone's working very hard. Yeah, yes. very good. I'm yeah. two thirds of the way through. Well, come I on, be, I, will on, be come finished, on. I will be finished by the end of the month. I will hit the deadline. I <laughs> promise. <laughs> it's coming out in July. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, there you go. Yeah. And on that note, that's fantastic. it. Well done. On that terrifying note of yes. deadlines approaching, that's yes. the end of this week's Cherry Anderson News. Go on, Chris. That was the news. It was the news. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be all right. It's fine. Are you working him too hard, do you think? No. Really? Yes, and he deserves a pay rise of several thousand pounds. <laughs> Great time for that. Yeah, okay, yeah. all right. Yeah. I mean, we can certainly work him less hard. Yes, yeah, that's think, definitely yeah. doable. Will, will, will you rest easy somewhere yeah, this year, do you think? Well, it's Thunderbirds next year, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, and I did yeah. just suggest another thing to you, didn't I? Yes. Yesterday, so. Yes, he's always suggesting yeah. things. I'll stop suggesting things. Anyway, uh, coming up, we have the voice of the Podstrongs because they've been emailing us at podcast.jerryanson.com. Yeah, Unstoppable. Yeah. Yes. Uh, we also have a brand new randomizer episode following our two party UFO adventure. Ooh, that was fun. Uh, yes. So we'll be asking our special guest to press the big old randomizer red button. Chris, over to you for our special guest. For, for our special guest. Interview. And that is? That is Mr. Gary Tompkins, mm. um, art director on Terror Hawks mm. back in 1983. Yep. Um, still working in the business, um, currently working on such things as in Star Wars movies and Harry Potter movies and all sorts of big name things like that. So Gary, thank you for coming all the way to Slough to see us today. Okay. Um, you are currently working on, or have recently worked on, such big feature films as Star Wars projects, mm-hmm. Harry Potter projects. Mm-hmm. But one of your earliest works was you were on Terror Hawks back in the nineteen yeah. eighties. So how did that come about? Well, um, I. I think it, it was a it was a call from Bob Bell actually, and I just finished on a movie, and I had this call, and he said we're doing this Jerry Anderson show uh, called Terror Hawks. Are you interested? And of course, being freelance and being fairly new to the industry, you say yes to everything. So yes, of course. And uh, met up with him. I think we met up in in a pub somewhere actually, and he told me about the the idea of the show. And of course, like so many people in my generation, we grew up with Thunderbirds and Stingray and all of those things. So Jerry Anderson was a, a name 
that was, you know, as big in my mind as, you know, any of the other sort of Lucases or Spielbergs. You know, it was a, it was a, it's a big name. So mm. never having done a puppet show before, but, you know, how hard can it be? And I think, you know, the, the confidence of youth. Um, oh, yes. It's like, yes, of course, I'd love to come and uh, work on it. So sure enough, a few weeks later, went down to Bray Studios and that's where it all began. Lovely. So um, were you much of a, an Anderson fan when you were younger to the extent that it was an influence on your career choice, possibly? Possibly. Um, I think, you know, I hit I hit the mark. Um, Thunderbirds, as a kid, that, that was... I was contemporary with the first screenings of Thunderbirds and, and Captain Scarlet and all those things. I had every dinky toy that came out and I still have up in the loft, but Ooh, good. <laughs> don't tell my wife. No, that's what we like. Uh, <laughs> I still got all those toys. I loved, as a, as a kid, I would draw stuff. I would draw, you know, incredible machines and spaceships and all of that sort of stuff. And so, you know, to have the opportunity to go and work on an Anderson show, it's like, well, of course I'm going to say yes. Yeah. Well, now we're going to put your Anderson knowledge to the test. Uh -oh. <laughs> this is where we play very short segments from the opening titles of all 18 of Jerry's shows. 18, wow. In chronological order. Wow. So when you see one that you recognise, okay. if you would care to shout out the title. Yes. And we'll see how many you get. Okay. Twizzle. Oh, yes. Uh, Torchy. Yeah. Four Feather Falls. Yes. Stingray. No. Oh no, Fireball XL5. Fireball XL5. Yep. Stingray, of course. Yeah. Thunderbirds. Easy one, yeah. Captain Scarlet. Mm -hmm. Gen 90. Oh yes. More obscure. Secret Service. Oh, got it. Oh, and uh, a UFO. Yep. Uh, protectors. Yes. We're doing very well here. Space 1999. Oh, of course, yeah. This is an emergency. Oh, Terror maybe. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Dick Spanner. Yep. Space Police. Ooh, space space precinct. precinct. I'll give you that, yeah. Right is that Lavender Castle? That is, yeah. Uh, no. That was New Captain Scarlet from oh, 2005. Oh, of course it was. Course yes. It was. So, Gary Tompkins, <laughs> I reckon at the end of that, you score... An incredible 16 out really? of 18. Wow. Um, we had a bit of a wobble with Supercar. Um, <laughs> Supercar, as, as of course. As people often, of course. often do, but no, 16. If there had been a few seconds and longer, I would have got that. Oh, yeah, absolutely, I yeah. The, it, it all goes speed by so kids. fast, yes. <laughs> but no, 16, that puts you in the, the top rank. Excellent. Of our... Uh, Super identification contestants. We will add you to the, the little rogues gallery on the front here next time. So you're filming Terror Hawks at Bray. What was the atmosphere like there in those days, the early 80s? It, it was terrific. We, the location of the studio for a start was, was wonderful. It was on the banks of the Thames. It was a lovely bar, which I think, you know... The legendary was Bray the bar. The legendary yes. Bray bar where lots of creative decisions and, uh, were, were, were made. One or two mistakes, yes. And the doors of the bar would open up and you'd go down on the grass and the lawns and, you know, have a, have a drink overlooking the Thames. Mm. Um, it's almost a sort of family atmosphere there. Uh, it, was, it was a much smaller studio than Pinewood or Shepparton or any of those other big studios where some of us had worked. But it, it, it just felt really small. You knew everybody. You knew the security guard. You knew the guy that ran the projection booth. You knew Nora in the canteen. You know, it, it really was a small sort of family. Um, felt like, it, you know, a small family set up. It was nice. Yeah, while Terror Hawks was filming, there was a documentary crew came in to film, I think it was for something called the Electric Theatre Show. Yes. And those rushes still exist in, in beautiful oh, HD amazing. on a really nice day. I think there's a shot of Alan Patillo sat yes. by the river. Yeah. And it all just looks absolutely lovely. But yes. as you say, yes, we've heard stories about the, the Bray Bar. The Bray bar. I mean, the, 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 one of the claims to fame of the Bray Bar is famously um, Pete Cook and Dudley Moore used to, fil used to record Derek and Clive down at Bray Studios. Ah. And on one of the covers of their albums, they're actually stood outside the doors of the Bray Bar. Oh, lovely. On the way down to the, to the river. So, gosh. That's a, <laughs> a nugget of trivia. 
So it was at one point quite a, would it be fair to say thriving studio? But by the time Terrorhawks came along, it was... Absolutely. It was they, not what it was. A lot of the, famously, a lot of the Hammer horror films yeah. were made down at Bray. Um, other smaller films were made there. But when Terrorhawks were there, we were the only film, well, the only show in production. Mm. And the only other times there would be anyone else within the studios were, we had lots of, there were two or three empty stages where bands would come. So if they were doing a big concert tour of the UK, they'd come and rehearse in the soundstage. Lovely. So uh, I think ACDC cracked the wall of the stage at one point. Ooh. I think it was ACDC, but, you know, but, you know, we'd often be in the workshops and, and hear, get a free concert, which was Brilliant. pretty cool. So what precisely were your duties on Terrorhawks when you, when you first started, at least? When I first started, uh, I was assistant to Bob Bell, who was designing it. Mm -hmm. and I would be, he would do a sketch, and I would do all the working drawings, so essentially the architectural drawings. So all of the sets, um, some of the, the full-size puppet scale craft I'd draw up, and then I would get those built either by the in-house team or Bill James was a, a subcontractor that built a lot of the sets for us. He was on Slough Training Estate, and he had actually done some of the earlier Anderson shows, he'd made some of the Thunderbirds craft. And, oh, nice. you know, back then he was fairly elderly, but he had this wonderful old school kind of construction workshop. You'd go in and smell the, the, the timber and the, oh, the wood shavings and, yeah. and he would build those sets. They'd then be shipped back to the studio and we'd, we'd paint them. And in collaboration with Steve Begg, who of course designed all the craft, um, he would design the liveries and then the, the small section that was puppet scale, we would then replicate and get all the markings to match the miniature craft Brilliant. that had, had been previously kind of established in the model workshop. So was there any sort of difficulty in, in, in keeping those matched or was that fairly painless process? It was fairly painless, I think. I think um, it was always useful for the, for the miniature to be, be established first and then we would match to that. Mm. So, you know, it was always a fairly small section of cockpit or that kind of thing. So... No, it okay. worked well, I think. Yeah. So you worked on Terrorhawks from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. um, if I played you a clip from an episode, would you be able to sort of talk us through what your roles, Ooh, what your responsibilities, possibly, yes, yeah, of providing you actually worked <laughs> on it? Um, it's for an episode that I know you you did work on. Uh, we've got a clip here from the episode Gunfight at Oki's Corral. Oh, yes. Yes. yes, this was a good fun. Oh, yes. <laughs> No sign of them, sir. I'm moving in. 10 10 0. Stop rolling on. I was close. Zero, come in. I found them, sir. And one of the swine just destroyed my helmet. How many are there? I'll check, sir. That's four. Sergeant Major, are you all right? Yes, ma'am. I'm drawing their fire in order to ascertain the number of the enemy. Here we go again. They think I'm alone. They've shown themselves. There's only six of them, sir. They've fallen for it. Let's give it to them, sir, in capital letters. <laughs> so Sergeant Major Zero there on the warpath in the episode Gunfighter Oki's Corral. Mm. Taking that clip, uh, was there anything you were actually involved with there specifically? Oh, yes. Or, I mean, you yeah. know, we were, I was involved in every episode all the time. Mm. So, you know, that, that was a, a set that we built on the puppet stage. Mm -hmm. um, Peter Holmes, who was the prop master who made all of the props. He also did a lot of painting of the backings. Mm -hmm. So the backing that you see there of the, um, the sort of mountains, that was done by him. And then we'd, we'd carve polystyrene for those rocks and make the polystyrene um, cacti and things. Uh, and again, Peter would do, like, I think the hat Peter made, although it was a costume because mm -hmm. it had the little Terrorhawks logo on. I remember actually that reminded me, we made a lot of kind of rub down transfers of that Terrorhawks logo. And it's, you know, where can we use them? Oh, let's put one on the hat. So. <laughs> <laughs> it 
we spent all this money on this artwork. Let's let's use it wherever we can. Oh yeah, may as well if you've got it. <laughs> yeah, I remember I've seen um, a sketch artwork of sets from that episode. Yes. Sam Oakey's cabin. Yes, and, absolutely. Uh, Sheriff Ball's office. Yeah, yeah. Once those sketches were sort of in place and approved, how closely did you have to stick to that? Could you sort of improvise, make absolutely jokes? Because after the first two or three episodes, where I was Bob's assistant, Jerry called me in and said, "I'm promoting Bob to." associate producer and I'd like you to take over as art director or you know designer in this case so again confidence of youth 20 years old of course I can do that yeah how hard can it be do anything yeah do anything and um so because of that all of those those sets I would do a sketch and then I would follow that sketch through with so the sketch I would show to the director whoever that might be whether that's Des Saunders, Alan Patillo, Natalie, Tony Bell and show it to Jerry, and once everyone approved it, then I'd do some drawings, we'd get the set built. And so I was kind of in control of how the set developed. So if during the course of the build there was something, we'd actually be better if we did that or that. Absolutely, we had complete control over, you know, what we what we did. And it was always great fun doing those, what I would call real-world sets. Mm. Spaceships are great, of course they are, but to, to replicate... Um, you know, the Sheriff Bull's office or Oki's cabin, it was it was almost more of a challenge because having to you're get everything a, in a in a smaller scale you're with a spaceship, an environment exactly. that's actually lived that, in exactly. Believable, so yes. with with objects and props that have to be replicated from the real world that people are familiar with, it's yeah. not just a, a kind of you know high tech spaceship interior. So which of course gives you more scope for like in jokes and yeah. nods to other oh, things. Oh, absolutely. Yes. Uh, yeah, in in Sheriff Bull's office, there were two wanted posters on the wall. Yes. Uh, which actually were Jerry and Christopher Burr, the other producer. But just to make them put a little twist on that, we actually cut the heads off. The, the, the days before Photoshop, this was on a photocopier. So we had Jerry with hair, with Christopher's hair, and we had Christopher with Jerry's bald head. So oh, <laughs> it was little little bits of fun like that that we... No one got in trouble for that. No. Neither of them noticed, no. <laughs> <laughs> We've got here a lovely Space 1999 <laughs> lunchbox with questions from our listeners. So if you would like to reach in, grab a couple of questions. Of course. That's it, of course. One and two. Let's see what you've got there. So this is from Paul Hilda. Are there ever any projects offered to you which you choose to decline? What would be typical reasons you'll pass on a job? I think the short answer is no. As I, as I touched on earlier in the interview, you know, we're all freelance and... You know, although it's a job that we all love, actually we do it to earn money. Yeah. So it, it, perhaps in the rare occasion that you're offered two jobs on the same day, I don't think that's ever happened in 40 years for me, but, you know, maybe you would choose one because of the, the designer, the director, maybe even the location of the studio. You know, do I want two hours on the M25 or do I want 20 minutes down the road? Oh, yeah. Things like that would come in. But I, I don't think I've ever actually turned a job down um for any reason like that, really, it's uh, maybe I'm too easy. I say yes to everything. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. And this question from Chris Owen: What would you most like to be remembered for, and what would you hope people forget? Oh, oh what question. a great question! Yeah. That is a good question. What would I most like to be remembered for? I, I. I the lovely thing about doing my job or any of us that work in the freelance film industry is we, we have such a breadth of different things. Mm. So, you know, something like this, it's wonderful that 40 years later, I'm still here talking to you about terror walks. Yeah. You know, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, this podcast will be in the ether forever, perhaps who knows, mm. <laughs> <laughs> but also I'm also proud of the fact that, you know, I've worked on Star Wars films. I've worked on, I worked on all of the Harry Potter films and continue to do work for the Harry Potter franchise the form of theme parks and tours around the world. So I, whether there's one thing, I don't know, but I, I, I would hope that big IPs like Star Wars, Harry Potter and Anderson, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm really proud to have been a, a small part, but a part of, of all of those. Yeah. It's, it's a wonderful thing. And that that's, as you say, that's going to last <clears> forever. <throat> mm. So was there anything with Terror Hawks that you really wanted to be involved with, but, either it didn't happen or it didn't quite happen in the way you were hoping. Was there a sort of freedom to, to say, I want to do this and they'll go, yes. Yeah, that's fine. I mean, I think the thing that I learned from a very early stage on that production was we didn't have a lot of money, mm. you know, unlike 
Star Wars, Captain Scar, particularly something like Space 1999, they had big, generous budgets. We were kind of starting again. You know, the, it, everything had been reset, really, and Jerry was starting on his, not from scratch, because he still had the name, but, you know, certainly starting on the way a production back up. company on the way back up. Mm. So we were always very mindful of not having a, a great deal of money to spend on the sets. So whenever we were designing them, we had to, you know, make sure it, it was either cheap to make or we could find something that we could use. So, yes, it always would have been nice to, oh, wouldn't it be great if? Um, uh, I think in, in a lot of ways, the, the, the challenge by having not a lot of money makes you more creative. Yeah. And we often used to go to the Slough Trading Estate there's that name again, yes. and and raid skips and, you know, things that factories were throwing out and vac forming. We, we found a particularly good vac forming company and, and plastic mouldings company, mm -hmm. which we would go, and with permission, I have to add, oh, yeah. uh, and, and, and take a take a van. We had a little yellow tatty old van that we had as a... As a <laughs> Getting a as bit a, only fools and horses. A, a yeah. little bit like that. It was very much like that. And we'd go up to the Slough Direct Trading Estate, fill the back with all this plastic moulded stuff. And that might have been you know, backs of TVs or components from washing machines. And you bring it back to the to the workshop and you get three backs of TVs next to each other. You spray them all silver and you put a little bit of electro tape on and a couple of red flashing lights. And suddenly you've got a bit of a high tech, I say high tech, um, background to one of your spaceships or, you know, a, an, an engine bay or something mm. like that. So in, in a lot of ways, even though we didn't have a lot of money, it, it it was fun to try and be creative and create something great with very little. And what you've got to remember is this is in a sort of post Star Wars, post Alien, post all of those you know really sort of seminal high tech sci fi movies that came out mm. beyond the world of the early Anderson stuff. And we were trying to emulate that. We were trying to we were trying to do Star Wars on a budget of you know, 35p an episode or whatever it was. It really was very, very little. But, you know, I think if you look towards the end, the, the latter episodes, we, we kind of got there. We, we, hmm. we Lots of backlit panels and Letra tape, which for the younger listeners was a, uh, there was a company called Letra Set that used to do rub down lettering pre-computer um, days. And one of the one of the things they did was this very fine tape, coloured tape, and you could get it in red and black and what have you. And that was a technique that was used extensively on the Star Wars films, um, established by the you know the, the original designers on the Star Wars films. Mm -hmm. And we thought that was a really good look, so so we did that on a lot of panels. So wherever you see a you know, piece of perspex sprayed black, and then a little white line around the outside, and then some buttons and some backlit panels, and it it kind of. I've, hopefully it looked fairly slick yeah well even going back to the the old super marionation days where they had the big budget you still th see things like lego bricks on top of oh, absolutely. control consoles or famously there's uh, a lemon, lemon squeezer, squeezer on the side on the of launch, on the yeah. one launch bay absolutely. yeah so they were doing back that even yes. back then yes using bits of uh, airfix kits to uh, oh, completely. build bridges and completely. such so it's, and i i think you know on some of the earlier episodes there was a, a tendency to go back to that and put toothpaste tube caps on as buttons and things but yeah. we, we tried to get away from a little bit of that in the latter episodes and just make it a little bit slick so if you look at the the design of the the terror hawk cockpit and things like that i tried to we tried to elevate it a little bit as as time went on so you would go back to an existing set from early episodes if it was still being used later yes, on and, exactly. and tweak it a little bit just to bring yes. it up to i mean you know with with respect to bob bell who was the original designer you know he came from that world of thunderbirds and captain scarlet and it was a kind of aesthetic mm. that he set which when i took over collectively we thought let's let's just kind of slightly remove the toothpaste tube lids and yes. let's put a back lid Letra tape panel on instead. Less, so. less Blue Peter, more, more <laughs> yes. Star Wars, yes. So is there anything that you could look back at, at Terror Hawks now and say, oh, I did that. There's that thing that I made. Are you? Is your memory of it as fresh? To, to yeah, I mean, a lot of things in, in a lot of the episodes. Um, you know, as uh, well, nothing actually that I physically made because, of course, we had the set builders and we had Peter Holmes, the, mm. the, the prop maker, but, you know, I can look at any episode, you know, where we've got the, the circus tent, for example, yeah. and the posters and the striped fabric of the tent. I remember quite clearly that. And 
um, Stu Dapple's mother's yes. house, where yeah. that was a really lovely thing. That's what I was talking about earlier, doing real world sets as opposed to sci-fi sets. And, you know, we had three little flying ducks on the wall that we modelled up and cast and painted up. And I had to make the whole interior of that house look quite sort of naff and chintzy yeah. and bad taste carpet. And or it, the, it was um, really good fun. Pete's Diner as well. Pete's Diner was great yeah. with, the, with the chairs and the the hamburger posters up on the wall and the chalkboard. Yeah, I, I, it, was, it was always very good fun doing those real world sets. Yeah. I think they're the ones that, that stick in my mind. Mm. More the, the more sort of uniform, functional yes. sort of control rooms and such. Um, similarly, even though it's, it's very simple, there's a lot going on in the back alley behind <coughs> the bar. Yes. That no, that's another of my yes. favorites. Yeah. That is another of my favorites. Mm. I did a little sketch for that with, you know, drain pipes and, yeah air conditioning units and all that kind of stuff and then made them up either by finding components that would would work straight away or getting prop makers to to make them up mm. so you know drain pipes instead of being that diameter you just get a smaller pipe and you put that on and clips and suddenly you've got a puppet scale drain pipe so so you're facing <laughs> problems that your your mind would never have thought to encounter before and you're having to to find absolutely. solutions on the fly absolutely yeah nice Okay, so going back to Thunderbirds, we are going to present you now with one of your favourite vehicles <laughs> from that yes. show. Uh, and to the surprise of many people, it wouldn't be one of the actual International Rescue no, Cars. This is a guest no, vehicle. Exactly. From the episode End of the Road. Mm hmm Visual check, tree and rock formation, range eight. Repeat, tree and rock formation, range eight. Roger, fire two and three. So that's the Pathfinder yeah. there from End of the Road, yeah. cutting its way through the... Uh, the forest there. What is it about that vehicle that, that stuck in your mind? I don't know. I, it, it, I think, you know, looking back at all the thunder, of course I loved all the main vehicles, but there was something about that. And I, I, I've got a very vivid memory of being seven, eight years old and, and actually drawing this amazing vehicle that was, you know, cutting through the undergrowth and, and making a road. And you could do the, the entire thing and then including all the white lines out the back, you know, this one big. And I used to draw all those vehicles all the time as yeah. a kid. And um, obviously, you know, based on that, and it was just something that really sort of appealed. <laughs> mm. It's amazing. It's only actually seen doing anything yes. in that one sequence, but Absolutely. it's still stuck in your mind and yeah. inspired your imagination. Weird, isn't time. it? Weird. But, you know, even, even now, you know, you drive past a, a huge kind of crane or a big construction vehicle on the motor and you think, oh, that's, that's really Thunderbirds. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's still there, yeah. even today. Let's Ooh. dig into our uh, tin <clears> of uh, <throat> listener questions here. Let's uh, take out a couple more for you. A two? Yeah. Right, that's great, thanks. Okay. So we've got three left for next week. <laughs> this is from Steve Bushell. Ooh. Hi, Gary. Wow, what a great CV. Thank you. How much direction did Jerry give you for Terror Hawks, or did you have free reign? Um, yeah, Jerry, quite a lot of, di quite a lot of direction. Um, but not, not overly, you know, having, having worked with other people since, you know, not, not a great deal. I think... You know, for, for both Steve Begg and myself, I think he let us have quite a free reign as to what we were doing. He was, you know, obviously like to he liked to see everything that we did. I can't remember many occasions where he said, oh, no, that's no good. Go away, do it again. Was he sort of peering over your shoulder all that much? Cause... Not not really, no. I mean, he had he was on the same. It, it was such a small operation. He was on the same corridor. You know, at oh. the end there was the art department. There was myself and Steve Begg and then come along couple of accounts offices and then there was Jerry's office and you know, do something and you knock on the door go in and show him oh, yeah this is great and 
and, and like I say, obviously, f for, for specific episodes, you would also be working with the director because mm -hmm. the director would have a, a good idea of what he wanted. And the scripts were always very good. Tony Barwick did terrific descriptions in the script. So, you know, it, it made life easy for, for us as designers to actually come up with a with an image which we could then show. And so I, in answer to that question, pretty much free reign. But he did like to see what you were doing. And on the whole, maybe it's just because we, we were great and we got it right oh, first yeah, time. Absolutely. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> he had faith in you, yeah. <laughs> Okay, this is from Roger Morgan. Is AI the greatest thing since sliced bread or a monster in sheep's clothing? Ooh. As an artist, I have already lost jobs because of AI. How do you feel about it? Oh, that's, a, that's another big question, isn't How long it? How have we got? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like all of these things, like all technologies, it's, it, it, it's a force for good and for bad. Um, I know a lot of... Um, concept artists in the, in the movie industry today are you know really concerned about AI because you can put anything you like in and suddenly there's an image and then you change it and so from that respect um, it is it's quite tricky um, I don't I I don't know where it will end no you know I I've heard so many things about the the ultimate sort of culmination of AI whereby it won't be so many years time before you can actually type in I want to watch a movie that's two hours long. I want it to be, have you know, directed by Alfred Hitchcock. I want the music by John Williams. I want it to star Paul Newman and Alan Rickman, and I want it to be a western. And then it'll come up with a movie, and there's your movie. And yeah. it's like, wow, you know, that's you can already do that's that with frightening with pictures and with yeah. music now as well. Absolutely so terrifying. Yeah, terrifying. But where's the where's the creative input on that? Where's the artistic? You know, I I, I can only hope that there will always be a human creative input oh, yeah. for, for, for good quality hmm. TV film. Maybe that's a vain hope. But listen, I, 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 re I remember probably 30 years ago, everyone said, oh, you'll never build another film set again because we've got this amazing thing called green screen and you can just put the actors yes. in front of a green screen. And, <laughs> and of course, it never happened. Yes, they have their uses, but it goes down. Yeah. Similarly, in, in fairly recent years... There are these things called volumes, which are LED screens that are 360 degree on stage. And again, you can you can put you can build sets digitally. You can put them on, on into the volume, and you can have actors with just a few kind of foreground props. And that's great, but not all the time. Yeah, which is that's what's been used for the Mandalorian, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, and you know, very successfully. But it, I don't think it, any of these new things ultimately completely take over. Yeah. I think. What I always say is embrace the best of the new technology, but don't discard the best of the old technology. Absolutely. Yeah. And try and, and it's the same with miniatures. You know, CG came in and it's like, oh, everyone's, everything's got to be CG. But for example, on the Harry Potter films, we used a big miniature model castle hmm. and then enhanced it with CG. So use the best of old school techniques, enhance them with the best of the new school techniques. And I think it's the same with AI. You know, let's let's hope it, it people use it wisely, and it 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 doesn't rule them; they rule it. Yeah, absolutely. Well, on that note, I think we're going to end part one of your interview. But will you come back next week to of chat course. a bit more about Terrorhawks, Thunderbirds, and of course Star Wars and <laughs> Harry Potter and so on? Well, thank you very much, Gary Tompkins. <laughs> Gary Tompkins. Uh, oh, uh, yes. It's always nice to have people who were there. Yes. The alumni. Podcast. We I, love alumni. It's incredible. It's a direct link to the past. Mm. That's right. And for some people, even though it was a long time ago, I bet it feels like a pretty recent past as well. Yeah. Because I know that feeling. Watching yeah, something that I was in 30 years ago. And it Where feels like does the time go? Extraordinary, isn't it? Uh, but part two of your interview next week, then, Chris. Yes, indeed. Unless something disastrous happens in the meantime. I don't say that. What? Well, me. <laughs> you know, it might happen. Okay. We might run out of phoneses at the Jerry Anderson store currently available on the discount <laughs> of OK Troy. And then where would we be? Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, yes. Uh, now, talking about running out of things, yes. <laughs> there is yes. a certain section of people who never run out of ideas to put into emails uh, to send to us at podcast at jerryanderson.com. We call them the Podstrons. Uh, would you like to hear their voice? Yeah. Yes. Let's let them in. Yeah. Yes. <laughs>
is the voice of the Podsterons. Podcast at jerryanson.com. It really is that easy. It's simple. It's been the same email address for five years. No, it hasn't. .co.uk. Yeah, we shifted from .co.uk to .com. Yeah. But the .co.uk still works. Still works, okay. yeah. Right. Well, but don't send them there. No, .com. <laughs> .com, please. Yeah, exactly. Uh, many of these emails are from the very same people who were emailing us five years ago. Yes. Isn't that lovely? Some new, some new. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I'm just saying. That, yeah. You see old names and new names. Yes, yeah, exactly. What have you got for there, Chris? Well, I've got an email from uh, Mr. Charlie Lagdon oh. saying, Hello, Jamie and Richard. Hello. Oh. I'm currently going through a rerun of Thunderbirds, original series, from yes. start to finish, and these episodes really take me back to when I grew up watching this series, as well as Captain Scarlet when I was nine or ten years old. As well as owning some of the Thunderbirds VHS tapes, I remember when my dad would record some of the earlier episodes, as well as a majority of the later episodes, like Path of Destruction and Alias Mr. Hackenbacker, mm-hmm. on VHS recording tapes, when they were broadcast on BBC Two back in 2004-2005, oh, right. one of the last screenings they had on the BBC. Yeah. Now 27, and going back to Thunderbirds, makes me feel like a younger fan again, and a series that's grown on me a lot more. It's so satisfying to see everything from the music, the launch sequences with the Thunderbird craft, the rising tension with the rescue missions, the visual and sound effects, the banter between Lady Penelope and that right geezer named Parker, the interactions with the Tracy family and vice versa, all coming together in these episodes of an entertaining series in which, to this day and age, holds up very well. I've also been listening to some of your great podcasts and I'm enjoying the discussions with the various interviews and of course the enthusiasm from you guys and Chris Dale oh, yeah. <laughs> because he's not a guy the jury's out on that oh yes indeed keep up the fantastic work and as any Tracy character would say yes. F.A.B. Of P.S. Yeah. Love the Parker Halifax advert. It's absolutely brilliant. Yes, that was um, <laughs> from some time that's ago. That's a few years ago. Yes, right. that's yeah. another uh, Century Twenty One films oh, right. creation. Yes. Oh, nice. Yeah. So good. Lovely. Yeah. I wish I had because I I didn't come across Jerry Ants and stuff really when I was a kid. We've had this discussion before. I know. I, it's not my fault. Just we never watched it. it was well, never in the house. You, and, you uh, could have sorted it out. Really? Well, really? But to have stumbled across Captain Scarlet or Thunderbirds, age seven, eight, or nine. Mm. Imagine that. Yeah. Time, prime yes. time for Rather than coming to it as a, you know, a cynical adult. Ah, oh. oh, you can see the strings. Yeah. And an adult who's got access to all of the sort of, you know, you can look it up on your phone. What yeah. is this? Yeah. If you just find it in, yeah. you know, 71, 72, if you're in the middle sure. of whatever exactly. region. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Hmm. What you got there between oh, your legs? Oh, I've got one. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Peter Dernan writes, yes. gentleman, singular, Oh, gentleman. Right. Oh, that, that'd be Ross. Gentleman. <laughs> yeah. Yes, okay. it must be for you, Ross. Uh, I've just watched the documentary for a second time. Oh. I continue to find it a hard watch regarding Jerry's childhood. This is Jerry Anton Life Uncharted. Yeah. Having said that, I really appreciate the honesty because a lot of the difficulties he faced could have so easily been brushed over. They could indeed. Sure. Anyway, the juxtaposition of Jerry's early life versus the absolute joy that he brought to millions of children and now adults was not missed by me. I think that Jamie has said many times that Jerry never believed in looking back and certainly never appreciated just how much his work would lo- was loved by so many, which is a massive shame. I think he did get it towards the end of his life, but not fully. Anyway, mm. uh, I hope that this is some comfort to Jamie, uh, the love and appreciation that continues to pour out from fans and posturons around the world. It is. Mm. Very best regards. Peter Turner. Thank you, Peter. Nice. I'm glad you rewatched it. Lots of people watching it again recently. I guess now it's an ITVX. Mm-hmm. Yeah. People picking it up and the DVD and Blu-ray and all that. Is it a difficult watch for you still now? I'm not suggesting you watch it every day, if you're going to say. No, I, it, it was, it's funny, actually, going when we did the, the little cinema tour where we did some screenings and Q&As, uh, the first two, I think, we watched the full thing, but after that, you sort of, yeah. you know... You rock up at the end. Well, we, we were waiting outside, yeah. and there's the, there's the bit at the end where we talk about Dad going into the, the, the home and being introduced to his neighbour and her name being Sylvia. And obviously the, the whole build up to that of all the, the hurt and the, mm. the pain and his regard for that name mm. and the fact that it means nothing, mm. listening, listening in for the audience going, oh, and there's yeah. quite often a big gasp or yeah. a, oh no, something like that. Uh, and immediately kind of around that bit, all around his, his passing, all that sort of stuff, that's still quite tricky to watch. Mm. You know, mm. Watching yourself cry on screen. Mm-hmm. Uh, when it's genuine is a, is a mm. bit of a difficult one but overall it's still a lovely thing and my favourite thing is the last 
the last bit where he talks about how he'd like to be remembered. Yeah. And he's got Crispin Morell's lovely Anderson Entertainment sting swell yeah. on there. Mm -hmm. And that's a really lovely yeah. kind of feel good moment. So, that, you know, yes, bits that are hard, but, but overall it's lovely to rewatch. Yeah. And so lovely that people like watching it. Yeah, mm. yeah that's right. And, you know, he was the sum of his parts, wasn't he? You know, without, without the difficulties mm. that, uh, that Peter mentioned there in his life, we might never have had any of these great series because they exactly, all go on to yeah. inform our worldview and our creativity. Exactly. And so on, Can't extract one from the other. That's right. Jane Ann Liston says, Dear Andersonians. Oof. Oh, I like that. that. Sounds a bit fancy, doesn't it? Sounds it? a bit like, a special tie. Like an old sounds a bit Smithsonian, like we should yes. be in a museum oh, somewhere. Uh, anyway, yeah. this, uh, the noise of Thunderbird 1's remote camera as seen in Peter Peril, and ah. we spoke about this in the last watch along. Is the same as that of the safety beam in Sun Pro. Is that right? I'm not think, sure. No? It, they're very close. Ah. It's possible that they might be sort of two different stretches of the same, same uh, effect, session. Yeah. Because yeah. yeah. the uh, the safety camera one is is just the same noise over. Right. I, won't, I won't do them. That. Wah, wah, yeah. Wah. Yeah. Whereas the safety beam had a bit more variety. So. Mm. Yes. I'm still convinced it appears somewhere else. If, if, if it's I'm not that, I'm sure it must do it's somewhere else. else. Yeah. Okay. But, We're still on the hunt then. Yeah, I think so. Uh, by the way, says Jane, I watched the whole Anderson Day and thought Dick Spanner was a hoot. Hey, <laughs> nice. Uh, and I was interested when Jamie said he wasn't that impressed by Joe 90 when he first saw it. Neither was I, says Jane. Having been enthralled by Thunderbirds in 1965 and then Captain Scarlet, thinking that perhaps I could one day be like the characters, when Joe 90 came along, I was 11 and realised I could never grow up to be like him because I was already a year or so older than he mm. was and it hadn't happened. Yeah, right. I get uh, that. That's, yeah. the, that's what we discussed before. It's the yeah. aspirational characters yeah. versus me in the show. Yeah. That's mm. two almost different audiences. Yeah. Maybe she says, Jamie, that explains your lack of enthusiasm too. Oh, that's and there's a Jamie Anderson place in St Andrews named after a golfer. A oh. fact, says Jane, though not a fat one. I mean, oh, it's, 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 it? it's semi yeah, fat. Maybe we could present the 400th podcast from Jamie Anderson Place. <laughs> <Gosh>. <laughs> Andrews, that'd be nice. Yeah. I mean, yeah. A little road trip podcast, sure. right? Yeah. yeah. I mean, you say that, it's not actually that far away, is it? Not on a universal scale, no. <laughs> we could do a road trip uh, somewhere. Keep them coming in, podcast.jerryanderson.com. We'll read out your emails next time. Um, but first of all, I think a little earlier, Chris, you asked Gary to press the big red randomizer button. Yes, I did. Let's this one see right how here. he got on. What he's chosen for us. Good luck, guys. Three, two, one. Uh, okay, here we go. Oh. Thank you, Gary. Let's see what he's got for us today. Bit of space breeze. Nice, isn't it? Right. Mm, there's not much space breeze left. Oh, okay. Uh, wow. Yeah. Okay, uh, always good. Yes, yeah, Four Feather Falls. Oh, nice. Four Feather Falls is perfectly yeah. little quaint. Perfectly I can't sound, think yeah. of Four Feather Falls without thinking of Chris being ridden by Sophie Aldred. Um, <laughs> that's going to happen forever Neither now. can I, really. No, no. no. Yeah. Life-changing. Tell us a little about Four Feather Falls before we start. Well, Four Feather so, Falls, so. 39 episodes, produced for Granada Television, uh, first airing 1960. It's a puppet western ah. with uh, the central character, Sheriff Tex Tucker, yes. voiced by Nicholas Parsons, mm -hmm. has um, four magic feathers in his hat, right. one of which enables his dog to speak, one of which enables his horse to speak, one of which enables one of his guns to fire without him touching it, yes. and ditto for the other gun. Oh, OK. And All there right. are other characters um, who live in the town, Great. good and bad. They're like little sort of bite-sized vignettes, aren't they? These yeah. Like, what, 10, 12 minutes each? Yeah, about yeah. yeah. Yeah, great. Shall we? Yeah. Why not? Specs on, I guess. Specs on. The four feathers on this hat are magic. Yes, they are, as Chris just said. Yes, yeah. I see. See, David explains it all far more efficiently than I can. So a little recap before each episode. Yeah. Andy, isn't it? For new viewers. Exciting adventure from Four Feather Fall. Promises excitement. Yes, well, I'll be the judge of that. Well, mm. yeah, but it normally delivers some uh, some cuteness and some charm. <sighs> including a, a very early version of the sort of walk down the alleyway from Captain Scarlet. Yeah. Absolutely right. Where we find our hero standing in darkness at the end of the street. It is a lovely, lovely shot. Lovely yeah. lighting, very dramatic. Yeah, it establishes that sense of danger. Ah, there we go. The magic guns. The magic guns, indeed. <laughs> and of course, that whole bit, bit connecting him to where he got the where he got, where he got the feathers from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a very, very nice, nice little explainer. Yeah. Chance um, of a ghost. Yes. Ooh, isn't that weird after our Ouija board experience the last oh, couple yes. of weeks? Oh yes. Ties together. It's almost like the randomizer knows. Yeah. Yes. Or maybe it's haunted. Often mistitled in episode guides as "Ghost of a Chance." Yes. Yes. <laughs> 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 
Understandably, yes. So, we're at the Eureka Silver Mine. Great name. Yeah. To pay for this mine. Another of these sort of one episode um, settings that you get in this show. You're up or down flat. Well, you get it for me at the price. Oh, what a tash there. Yeah. And uh, there's something in it for you. Nothing to do. This is Mr. Jackson, the bank manager. Figures $20,000 and you will... Very fussy man. Oh, well, uh, hey, let's not fall out over that. I'm sure if there's the ghost of a chance... What? Ah. Ah. We've established that's not what the episode is called. <laughs> and here are Pedro and Fernando and a couple of white sheets. Oh. What are they going to do with the white sheets, Chris? Oh, making well, beds, obviously. <laughs> yes. Yes, they're, they're housekeeping. Uh, just to show there's no hard feelings, I'd sure take it kindly if you'd ride along with me. To... And I haven't seen many puppets in Four Feather Falls that I'd say are sort of, oh, no, they're a bit scary. You kind of accept that it's fairly crude because they're quite early. But this guy, his eyes... Mm. I know he's meant to look a bit boggle-eyed because he thinks he's seen ghosts. No, spoiler. Um, oh, Chris. <laughs> but he looks that way before he sees the ghosts. So <laughs> yeah. it's kind of... Yeah, that's right. <laughs> it could be. It's, yeah. it's very ambitious, though. Oh, yeah. You think about all the other sort of Watch With Mother type stuff mm. mid, mid to late 50s versus everything here. Yeah. The scale of the sets and the depth and the lanterns and the yeah, walk. And what's really so nice there is, is the light rising and falling on his body as he lifts the lantern. Yes. yes. Which, of course, that light isn't yeah. coming from Somebody that. with a... That's right. Yeah, it's a lovely a touch. touch. <gasps> oh, oh, it's, nice. a very, it's a very convincing <laughs> ghost. <laughs> oh, the hat ruins it. Oh, no. <laughs> Don't ghosts wear hats? No, it just passed straight through them, wouldn't it? Oh, great. It passed straight through them. I love the way he... Uh, actually, so we can differentiate between the ghosts, isn't it, obviously? Yes. I mean, sorry, that's very silly of me. <laughs> so I guess this is the Night Watchman. He's been scared off of the, uh, the mine great by the ghosts. Great runaway there. Yes. <laughs> they didn't even do eye holes for themselves. That was no. a bit silly, wasn't it? It reminds me a bit of... Um, was it Cousin It from the Adams family? Yeah. Oh, oh. With the, with the what? Hang yeah. on, hang on. <laughs> What's he on fire? Well, because... <laughs> Why is he grinning about it? He, he likes his, his cigars. He likes his cigars. Oh, yes. there you go. There's a warning to all and of yeah, you smokers out there. everywhere. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, Make a thousand dollars just for putting on his... They really are idiots, aren't they? <laughs> and now he looks like he's just had his hair done. They all come around there. Stepped out of the shower. Miners. Yes, it's their latest wacky scheme to get money from the... Uh, the townsfolk of Four Feather Falls. So Jackson got to sell the place for peanuts. Now there is a rather obscure link between this episode and my latest novelisation, First Action Bureau what? Damaged Goods. What? Do tell. Yeah. I don't know if I should tell you. Okay, don't then. Okay, <laughs> just hint at it. <laughs> I will just say the name of the uh, silver mine is uh, quite pertinent. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Okay. Oh, so Nero Jones doesn't face people with blankets thrown over their heads pretending to be... She does set fire to herself while smoking, though, unfortunately. What happened? Joe, what do you think you're doing? Oh, this is Joe. Now you get back there right away or you're fired. You can... Oh. <laughs> oh. As the bank manager, I have the authority to fire the night watchman at the mine. <laughs> that mine is never. Oh. Again, another theme for the last few weeks is insensitive bosses. Yeah, yes. well, we all know about that. <laughs> oh. Talking. I've seen it with my own eyes. He was after me, all right. Also, I've spotted my part in this series, the barman. Yeah? yeah. Are you? Yeah. Years ago, I heard tell that mine was haunted. Oh, I don't believe it. There's Grandpa Twink, who... I, I don't know if, if, Jamie, this might be more your thing. Do you remember uh, uh, Donkey Kong Country? Very vaguely. Yes, he, he does remind me of um, is it Grandpa Kong or Cranky Kong in Cranky that. The face Kong. is... He, he's got quite a simian-looking face. Yeah. Voiced so expertly by Sophie Aldred and uh, Lester for our live uh, <laughs> Yes, live but not on the original. <laughs> no. David Graham, <laughs> uh, right. back then. No, that was me. Yeah. Was I, was, I was Grandpa. <gasps> she was little Jake. Oh, yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. Some voices. I better get back. <laughs> I can't. Look, there we are, you see? Yeah, I can see that. One line of resemblance. You need yeah. a touch. Yeah. Morning's work. Yeah. I suppose that goes for you too, Grandpa. Me scared? Oh. I ain't never been scared in my life. Oh, yes. Grandpa famously is not scared of anything. Oh. So he's probably going to go and check it out all by himself. Yeah, off he goes. Uh, smart. Good night at work, Fernando. Now we go home. <laughs> we put the blankets over our head. We scared one guy. It's good night's work. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've earned $1,000 from doing that little stunt. Yeah. Might yeah. well. Around, Twink. <clears throat> Better cover all the ground. 
if I were about it. <laughs> yeah, everything seems hunky dory to me. Hunky dory. Hunky dory. Great dory. Phrase. Oh. <gasps> what was that? No. What? That's the cat from. Oh, yes. From UFO. UFO. <laughs> oh, no, it's not. Oh, they're not even trying now. No. They're gonna... Look! Gonna do this scare for free. The ghosts! Hang on. Then who are they? I think it. Ah, see. They're a lovely double act, these two. Now, look, quick, put on your sheet, quick. They sure is. They're very much the Orin and Romek of this place tonight. <laughs> Marvin! Marvin! <laughs> what is it? Look! Hey. <laughs> Run away! <laughs> this is the easiest money they've ever earned. <laughs> Absolutely. For sure. <laughs> In the morning we see Zeke and I get a thousand dollars from him. Wow. Nice. Gosh. Two thousand dollars reward <laughs> to anyone able to free. Two thousand dollar reward to anyone able to free the Eureka Mine of Ghosts. Yeah. And <laughs> Marvin Jackson. So the exorcist essentially is what we're hoping <laughs> yes. for. Oh, those old timey ghostbusters. <laughs> Nothing I can do except to take Zeke Harmon's off it. Ah. Ah. So good old Dusty the dog. Is that Denise doing the apps, do we think? Um, could be. She did like her animal noises, she but really I would did. assume it was um, Kenneth Connor, but. Yeah. Maybe I could imagine Dinny sort of muscling him out of the, the way of the microphone. Oh, no, I love doing little dogs. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we have some recording of her just making dog noises because she wanted to. Yeah. Yes. And cats, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, she did foot so, didn't she? Yeah, because she wanted to. Yeah. For putting on a sheet. Sure. Then why don't we. Yes, Dusty is um, eavesdropping on Pedro and Fernando, getting yes. to the bottom of their evil plan. Yes. Because Tex Tucker has yet to appear to um, do anything. Absolutely, yeah. yeah where is he's he? Taking his, he's probably got his feet up singing. Yeah, uh, or in the bath. In the bath. He's yes. always in the yeah. bath. He does like his baths. <laughs> Come on. So they've now got a plan. I better get on back. They've always got now a plan. The two thousand dollar reward, as well as a thousand dollars. Yes, they've they're so paid. crafty. These two. By ridding oh, the mind of the ghosts. Yeah. You say Mr. Harmon gave them a thousand dollars. And again, very crude puppet, but I do like the hand on hip. Um, yeah. body language you get with text sometimes yeah. Yeah. yeah there's lots of extra expressive stuff and mm. intelligent choices and things to try this has also got some lovely Barry Gray music mm. oh, we don't have to do nothing all we have to do just sit here all night and tomorrow we go to Jackson and get the money. Right. Yeah. Fine. They're smart. Yeah. Nothing can stop them now. Oh, no. But what? They'll be able to buy a bigger shack. <laughs> one coming. And a new sheet to replace yes. the one that uh, yes. Fernando broke. Hang on a minute. <gasps> Fernando, quick! Zeke! What are we gonna do? We got to be the ghosts again! Quick at the sheets! <laughs> quick at the sheets! <laughs> oh, I beg your pardon. Uh, <laughs> really convincing. I know. I can't see <laughs> Hang on, he must have had a spare sheet, because that's... Yeah, well, I think people do have more than one sheet in, about their yeah. house. Well, so they... In the old west, they would have been a bit pricier. You yeah. Just... Well, they've just been, they just earned a thousand dollars. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. They would have bought themselves a new sheet. Sheets sheet. galore. <laughs> yeah. For... <laughs> All right. Oh, they get them covered on expenses, probably. Yeah. Nobody about. Uh, they must have gone away again. Then maybe we finish our supper, no? Meanwhile. Why? Ooh. It's you. You double. <laughs> the guy who owns the mine. <laughs> what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, I own the mine. Mine. And I'm going. This mine is mine. Now, are you going to play it my way? Or do I have to fill you full of lead? No. Yeah, again, that's not something you hear in Andy Pandy all that often. No, no. It's hard to eat. I wouldn't do a deal. There is a, a dangerous edge to this show at times, which mm. is sort of immediately undercut by the, the silliness of these two sitting in with sheets, but it, yeah. it, it somehow all balances out. Oh, get out of here quick. Hey, <laughs> I love this. Oh, take Gee, thanks, Dex. You sure saved my life. That's okay, Mark. Yeah, Texas arrived. As for you, Harmon, 
The next time I'll hit you plumb where it hurts most. Oh. <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. No, but we all know where that, where that is. So. Oh. Oh. Okay, fine. Get oh. me. No. No. Get going, I said. Hang on. Oh. It's not even... Buttons. It's not even real money. I go for... No. Wah, wah. And an early example of changing the uh, puppet's face to create mm. a new expression. Didn't bother with the command though. <laughs> Tee -hee. Yes. <laughs> and given that we never see that character again, I'm going to assume that he was he, killed. Yeah, yeah. off camera. Absolutely. Well, yeah. Shot yeah. in the back. That's yep. great. Quite right too. He's running away. Because they're never nice. going to get in trouble anyway. They may as well you know, just kill him. Why not? <laughs> so. That was Wolf of the Falls. I Chance of a Ghost. Yeah. yeah. They're lovely, aren't they? Yeah, they are they're lovely. They're, they're really sweet, sweet, nice little stories. Charming, innocent little stories, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that's yeah. right. It would be churlish and cruel to to hope for anything more, I think, from a 10, 12 minute. Yeah, snippet. from that time as well. Exactly. I mean, but yeah, for, for that time, it's head and shoulders above everything yeah, else. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's lovely stuff. Yeah. Andy Pandy versus Four for the Falls. Yeah, exactly. I'll go with Four for the Falls. Thank yeah. you very much. And for that reason, I think I'm going to give it a solid four and a half. Ooh. Oh, oh. That's the highest Gosh. I've ever awarded anything so far. I'm even drinking. Mm. <laughs> That's... Chris? See, I don't know Four for the Falls as well as I know the other shows, mm. so it's a bit difficult to judge score. I'm going to say a three and a half. Mm. Oh. All right. And I thought I was being nice with the three. Yes. There we are. Four Feather Falls. Lovely. Yeah, enjoy that very much. Podstrons, mm. have you seen that particular episode before? Did you watch along with us? What do you think? Let us know. Podcast at jerryanson.com. Where would you rate it out of five? High or low? It's very sweet. Yeah. It was sweet. Yeah. yeah. And I'd love to get it on Blu-ray. Ah. Hint, hint. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, all right. I know. Ever going to happen? Could happen. We're, we're, we're trying really hard, yeah. but uh, not not currently getting anywhere. Yeah. But, uh, is Four Feather Falls as inaccessible as certain other things? Or? They're all equally inaccessible yeah. currently. Um, That's a shame. So no, we, we, we're we ready to get on with it and do these things, but mm. Um, mm. there are other parties that need to agree to that. So, yes. Yeah, right. oh, I'll have to sit tight. Good. Well, talking of sitting tight, we hope you <laughs> sit tight till next week and join us again for the next podcast where we'll have another edition of the randomizer yes we'll have part two of chris's interview with gary tomkin yeah yes. we'll have more newsy news 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 Probably. and crucially more emails from our pod store yeah oh, nice yeah. Yeah. yeah same time next week mm, yeah Go on, then. then yeah yeah see you then you. Bye. bye bye let's get started Let's go! Spectrum is green. Should I tell you what's really off-putting? That lovely smell of food yeah. that suddenly appeared from somewhere. Yeah. Yes. My yeah. stomach's rumbling. Oh. I'm ready for lunch. What do you think it is? Something beige, I think. Mm. I'm thinking a pie, maybe. A pie? I'm thinking Ooh. scampi. Something like yes. that. Oh, yeah. There's be. something breaded in Chip, there, I think. Chips. Certainly mm. chips. Mm. Oh, now we should be at it on Saturday. Possibly a I slight know. soup element. A soup? Play, a soup? Maybe. I, yeah, yeah, I, can't oh, I hadn't got the soupy yeah. whiff. Maybe it's a scampi and chip soup. Oh. Soupy whiff. Should we go? Just we go and investigate the yes. soupy whiff. <laughs> soupy whiff. Soupy whiff. That was an Anderson Entertainment production. <laughs> <laughs>